Okay, so welcome everyone and sorry for a little hiccup, but that's all right. We'll get to see, you get to see our faces another time and we don't get to see yours anyway, so it doesn't make any difference in terms of all the participants. But um, your voice you're listening to is Chris Norman, so I'm the CEO of NRM Regions Queensland and very proud to work with Adam Knapp from QFF on the work that we're doing at the moment about building a stronger knowledge brokers network to support uh, carbon farming and in particular land restoration fund and and acknowledge the Queensland Government for their support with that. Um, and firstly, obviously acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we're all sitting on today. I'm actually down in Port Macquarie, so I'm sitting on Burpee People's Country, um, but acknowledge all the traditional owners and their contribution to the Australian landscape over the last 60,000 years and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So, as we alluded to, this is the second webinar that we've been running. So we've got four webinars and this is part of a joint project with the QFF and NRM Regions Queensland and the regional NRM bodies. Um, and so, yeah, I acknowledge Adam and his name there, Louise, who you've seen, and she's the facilitator being employed by us to run this project. Um, John Gavin, who's the CEO linking to this work and an expert in carbon farming in our network. Um, Tom Webster from DES and the Land Restoration Fund and, and Gillian who's speaking today uh, from also from DES. Um, so I guess just a little bit of housekeeping um, whilst my system plays up a little bit here. Um, yeah, just stay on mute if you wouldn't mind. The, the chat box is there to say hello and share some introductions, but we're looking for questions to be added to the Q&A box. Um, so we have got a bit of time today to do Q&As and, and Louise will facilitate that. But if people want to add questions at any time to the Q&A um, prompt, that would be great. Um, in saying that we're on mute, we are encouraging people to, to show a bit of um, interaction through the little smiley faces and the other things that come up occasionally that you can use to uh, interact. As we alluded to, it is being recorded. So these webinars are being recorded and will become available somewhere around Easter time. That They'll be available both on the NRMRQ, Regions Queensland website, as well as the QFF website and elsewhere. And we are encouraging the sharing of these webinars. Um, I won't talk about video cameras because we can't see them anyway. Uh, so the, the, the format today is for Gillian to speak for about half an hour and share her screen as we practiced before to take us through how the land restoration funds working in Queensland, some of the learnings to date and the opportunities going forward. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and have a bit of a conversation through the Q&A and, and Louise's facilitation. So I think without any further ado, I might pass over to Gillian, who hopefully we can hear her voice and we can see her screen. Thanks. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Before we do, Gillian, Tom's just prompted me that there's a few people from the LRF team here, which I guess you'll probably introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, okay, hopefully, Louise, can you just confirm yes. I'm sharing my screen now? Yep, that's Great. perfect. Full screen. Terrific. Uh, thanks so much, Chris, for the introduction. So as he's um, mentioned, my name is Julian Main. I am the Director of the Land Restoration Fund in the Department of Environment and Science in the Queensland Government. Um, I do have a number of my team on the line at the moment. So Tom Webster is the is our communications engagement uh, manager. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many other people are on the on the line, but I believe that um, Paige Perry and Brett Kerr are on the line. Pahi Cooper um, is also on the line, and there may be others. And I apologise to them if I haven't if I haven't mentioned them. Um, we're a relatively small team. We're about um, eleven people working on a quite a large program of work um, to the value of about $500 million. Um, and so uh, every member of our team has contributed very extensively to, extensively to the work that we've done so far. So um, today I'll also start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting today, the various countries, um, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So what I tend, tend to run through today is um, just a, a, a brief overview of the Land Restoration Fund, but focusing predominantly on the difference between the Land Restoration Fund and the Emissions Reduction Fund. Um, I, 
I hope that people have a basic understanding of carbon farming. If I'm going too fast, please feel free to put something in the chat. Um, Louise, I can't see the chat when I'm presenting. So if you need me to stop, please just interrupt and, um, and let me know. Yep, thank you. Um, so I'll run through some of the objectives of the, of the LRF. Um, uh, the, uh, the way that we operate within the carbon market, which is really important to understand our role in the carbon market. Um, I'll provide you with an overview of the Commonwealth functions, so the Clean Energy Regulator and the Department of Industry, Science and uh, Energy um, that we work with. Uh, I'll differentiate between the RF and the LRF, as I said, um, just to run through what co-benefits means for, for the LRF. It's a, a clear distinction between but, uh, between us, between the Land Restoration Fund and any, anybody else operating in the carbon market. Uh, we'll look at some of the round one outcomes and um, then we'll talk about some of the other barriers to the market that we're working on just very briefly at the end. Um, so I'll just start, I do have a couple of videos to share during this as well. So um, I'm hoping that uh, they work and I can get my screen working here. Um, so the Land Restoration Fund was established in 2017. It was a commitment from the, from the Labor government to establish the, establish the fund with the remit of growing the carbon market in Queensland. Um, what was recognised was that there's a huge opportunity. Queensland has a large natural capital base and therefore we have a, a significant competitive advantage in Queensland to, um, towards carbon farming. Um, we have lots of natural capital, lots of natural assets that should be leveraged um, to meet the growing demand for carbon offsets. Um, the other, the other remit is to, um, our objective is to pursue environmental and economic co-benefits as defined by government. I'll go through co-benefits in a little bit more detail later on, but effectively what co-benefits are are the, the additional impacts or benefits that arise from carbon projects. So once you start to plant trees, for example, you end up with um, good outcomes for, um, for threatened species potentially, or for threatened ecosystems, for water health, um, but also for communities in terms of um, jobs retained in communities, um, on land opportunities for um, our indigenous people to, um, to, to, to uh, work with their traditional land practices. Um, and those other economic and social co-benefits um, are, are as important um, to the government. Um, the other thing we do is just support research and development into, into emerging areas. So when we say we're growing the carbon market, we're not just investing. So investing is one way that we um, is one way that, that we that we stimulate the market. So we create a demand for carbon credit units with co-benefits. But we also invest in making the industry, the market easier for participants to enter into. And there's a number of ways that we do through that through um, working with the Commonwealth on carbon method development. We work with capacity building, just like we're doing with you today. Um, we make sure that there's plenty of information out there available out there for landholders to make sure that they understand the opportunities, but also the risks and issues that arise with carbon farming. Um, and we do a lot of significant research into co-benefits um, and into the additional benefits from carbon farming. I'm just going to run you through a video now, which gives you an overview of the, um, of the Land Restoration Fund. Um, I think it's pretty informative and better than listening to me speaking for lots of time. The Land Restoration Fund is a Queensland Government initiative uh, with a $500 million investment into carbon farming projects that will deliver additional social, environmental and economic opportunities for Queenslanders. The fund has two main purposes, to invest in carbon farming projects that deliver priority co-benefits and to broaden the scope of carbon farming in Queensland with investments in research, development and innovation. 
The Land Restoration Fund will benefit Queenslanders through direct investment in regional economies, offering new income streams through the novel commodity of carbon credits. It also benefits the state's broader objectives by supporting improved environmental health, uh, social outcomes for First Nations peoples and jobs in regions. Global warming is an issue for all Queenslanders, especially our primary producers on the land um, working with nature. The carbon farming industry is an important part of Australia's transition to match the threat of global warming. It will help our economy shift and our primary producers shift. The direct benefits of investment in regions mean jobs for Queenslanders. And it also will support healthier soils, underpinning the vital agricultural production of Queensland, improve water quality running into our Great Barrier Reef and our other wetlands, and support our unique biota. The Land Restoration Fund works by leveraging Australia's carbon market, which is primarily controlled by the Commonwealth Government. The Clean Energy Regulator in Canberra controls the issuance of Australian carbon credit units and LRF projects will register with the Clean Energy Regulator to generate those Australian carbon credit units. There are three broad types of methods that are eligible for land restoration fund projects. They fall into agriculture, vegetation and savanna burning. Agriculture methods are focused on reducing emissions from things like fertiliser use or the enteric fermentation from ruminant animals like cattle and they can also sequester carbon, store carbon in soil in agricultural systems. Vegetation methods are mostly about regrowing or not clearing native vegetation. So you can have environmental plantings or human induced regeneration of native forests. And savanna burning uh, methods and projects are focused on reducing the extent of late dry season wildfires which release really potent greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide and methane by putting in earlier dry season fires to reduce the risk of those late hot fires. The Land Restoration Fund differs from the Emissions Reduction Fund, the ERF, in that it's not focused on lowest cost abatement, but it values the additional co-benefits that pro projects produce. The Land Restoration Fund uses the structure of the Emissions Reduction Fund to let projects generate Australian carbon credit units. We simply replace the Commonwealth as the buyer of those Australian carbon credit units. And we differ from the Emissions Reduction Fund also in the fact that we consider the co-benefits that come from projects priority co-benefits for Queensland like improvements to our biodiversity, cleaner water running into the Great Barrier Reef and new opportunities for our First Nations and other regional economies. So we value the uh, co-benefits that come from LRF projects but we're using the carbon crediting mechanism of the ERF. Put simply, it's just a higher value type of project that the LRF is investing in. For more information, visit the Land Restoration Fund website. Right, now I have to work out, sorry, how to get to the next <laughs> slide. Maybe you don't have inappropriate uh, YouTubes on. No, exactly <laughs> right. Oh, here we go. Sorry, now I've gone too far. Um, okay, so... You should be able to use your um, camera now. Yeah, too, I Julia. might just have to do that at the end because I feel like if I yeah. change this now, I might lose yep. my spot. Um, yeah, <laughs> but, okay, so Don covered off on, so that was, sorry, that was Don Butler, who was our um, former chief scientist for Land Restoration Fund. He was really integral in helping to us to establish um, the co-benefits framework in particular um, and uh, he has moved on from the Land Restoration Fund but we now have Linda Lee who's our Chief Scientist who will, uh, has just joined us and will um, continue his good work. So this slide really tries to articulate what John was talking about in the video about the role of Land Restoration Fund in the carbon farming market, uh, the carbon farming pipeline. Um, so where, where we sit is in two places. So where we talk about our dual function, apologies, I just lost my microphone, 
where we talk about a dual function of uh, being um, an investor, um, we invest in industry development. So really that's what we're talking about is we're talking about working with suppliers and professional services, but also the Commonwealth um, to try to make that pipeline a little easier for people to, to enter into. And then we stimulate um, supply by being a buyer in the marketplace too. And I'll go through the various um, buyers in the marketplace um, in, a, in a minute, but um, you can see that we, we sit in that voluntary market along with the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth also sits in the voluntary market, um, but also in the regulatory market. Um, the other role of the clean energy regulator is that they administer the clean energy, clean, uh, sorry, they administer the Carbon Farming Initiative Act, um, which is the, the, the legislative flame framework that carbon farming operates from. Uh, without that act, um, there would be no land restoration fund uh, because we rely on that framework for carbon farming and the, the legislative methods of carbon farming so that it can produce the Australian carbon credit units, which are tradable commodities. So that's a very important concept um, to understand is that everything flows from that and we are a player in this marketplace. Uh, this, this slide sort of, uh, I guess, somewhat says the same thing, but um, it's really talking about the fact that um, that the, uh, the clean energy regulator and the Department of Industry in the Commonwealth Government play critical roles in the marketplace. Um, so the Department of Industry, Science, uh, Energy and Resources is, so we call them DISA. They're the ones who uh, establish the, the legislative framework um, that the clean energy regulator then oversees. It's the Minister for Industry that, that sets the, um, the agenda for how the market will develop over time and sets the priorities for developing new methods. And until recently actually developed the new legislative methods for carbon farming. Uh, but recently there's been a change of that function to the clean energy regulator. So then the clean energy regulator has uh, a number of functions other than being the administrator. They also, they, they do things like um, they administer the Australian National Registry of Emissions Units. So that's called an annual account, which is where carbon units are, are held. So they're the ones who issue the carbon units and hold and uh, keep the register of those carbon units. Um, they have a function under the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Scheme. So that comes into the more regulatory market. So where there are certain industries that are required to reduce their emissions uh, on a base standard. Um, and so the Clean Energy Regulator is responsible for administering that. Um, they look after the Emissions Reduction Fund. So the Emissions Reduction Fund is, is about um, uh, I guess the, the legislation uh, for reducing carbon emissions and increase of clean energy in, in Australia. Um, so their role in the Emissions Reduction Fund is as a buyer in the same way that the Land Restoration Fund is a buyer. So they actually buy Australian carbon credit units in the voluntary market. They run it through an auction system. So people who have developed carbon farming projects um, have carbon credits in their annual accounts and they can uh, put in a put in a um, an auction put them up for auction um, and then the commonwealth determines whether they're going to buy them or not the commonwealth is buying those at um, lowest cost and i'll run through that in a minute um, so they have a lowest cost abatement target they're actually buying those units to retire against the commonwealth government's emissions uh, so the actual government itself is reducing its emission, emissions by buying Australian carbon credit units. Uh, they also have a renewable energy target. So that they hold a number of functions. They're a very important agency in the carbon market. Um, and there are then other organisations or other, other players in the market, including Land Restoration Fund. So the fundamental difference between the Land Restoration Fund um, and the Emissions Reduction Fund is the concept of co-benefits. So we are both buyers 
in the voluntary market for Australian carbon credit units. The difference is that the Commonwealth is seeking through the, through the Clean Energy Regulator is seeking to pay the least amount of money possible for carbon credit units. And that's because they want to offset their own emissions at the lowest cost possible price. The Land Restoration Fund, on the other hand, is buying premium credit carbon credit units. And the way that we determine what's premium is that the, is the, the projects that deliver the greatest amount of co-benefits for, for Queensland. Um, they most often, uh, more uh, more expensive projects to run and therefore we are willing to pay more for those outcomes than the Commonwealth would. Commonwealth's not interested in co-benefits. They do register them on an annual account. So an, you can see from, from uh, a project, the project register that the Clean Energy Regulator holds that there are projects can go in and tell them what the co-benefits are that are linked to their, to their um, project. Uh, and that's for the benefit of other buyers, not for the Commonwealth. Um, so the importance, the, the important similarities or the importance uh, of the Land Restoration Fund and Emissions Reduction Fund is that you cannot come into the Land Restoration Fund without having a registered Emissions Reduction Fund project. So that means you must have a, a, a project that's able to be registered with the Clean Energy Regulator um, so that it can that it can uh, produce ACUs that are following the methods that are set down in legislation. Um, so it's a gateway. The Emissions Reduction Fund is a gateway for the Land Restoration Fund uh, for, the, um, for the issuing of ACUs. Then the Land Restoration Fund is a buyer of those ACUs um, and we buy them um, and we also pay for the co-benefits. Um, so the purchasing method is a, is a clear differential here and what I talked about before is that the Emissions Reduction Fund are contracting for lowest cost ACUs through reverse auction. Uh, the Land Restoration Fund, we've done one investment round and we, uh, we, we called for projects that, um, uh, that, would, uh, that we could purchase carbon credit units from uh, with co-benefits. Okay, so this slide talks about how do our, our restoration fund projects work. So um, I guess just stepping back a couple of steps here is that I mentioned before previously that we have two investment arms. So we invest in um, we invest in improving market conditions for um, for the marketplace. So we're trying to grow the pipeline of um, of carbon opportunities in Queensland. Uh, and then we're also buying uh, ACUs through our investment uh, investments in commercial on the ground projects. We actually do those commercial investments through uh, a trust um, and we will hold those ACUs and potentially sell them on down the track in order to create a revolving fund. Uh, for reinvest, so we sell them to reinvest back into carbon farming. So this is the, the the remit for us is to grow the marketplace, not to not to offset our own emissions necessarily. Um, so when I talk about um, that that investment through commercial arm, what we're buying is what we call LRF premium carbon credits. So they are carbon credits with mm -hmm. co benefits. So. Um, the carbon credit units are exactly the same as um, every other carbon project yeah. is buying, but then we also have these co-benefits, the social, environmental and economic co-benefits that are associated with those carbon credits. Uh, so what we're really, what we're looking for, as I've talked about before, is diversified incomes for opportunities, opportunities for landholders. Um, we are looking for projects that have great employment opportunities in regional and remote communities. Uh, very particularly, we're looking for the environmental outcomes. It's much, you know, that, that's a, a very key tenant of the Land Restoration Fund is that we're looking for restored land for environmental outcomes. Uh, so for uh, ecosystems, protection of threatened species, um, and, uh, and no, not, not least of which too is the carbon sequestration outcomes as well. Um, this video is just going to run through what 
co-benefits are in the same way that um, John ran you through what the land restoration funds principles are, then this will talk to you about um, how we value co-benefits. Co-benefits are the additional outcomes from carbon projects that benefit society more broadly. They can include environmental benefits, social benefits and economic opportunities. They're important because we know carbon projects can deliver these types of benefits and valuing them can bring carbon projects that are strong in co-benefits to market earlier before the carbon price needs to rise to make them economically viable. So valuing co-benefits increases the value of carbon projects that are delivering those benefits. And that's the core concept of the Land Restoration Fund. The Priority Investment Plan and Co-Benefit Standard set out the rules and priorities for Land Restoration Fund investment in co-benefit producing projects. So the first place to go when you're thinking about applying is to those documents to think about the assets that you have on your land and in your broader community in relation to the eligibility set out in that standard. So if you're thinking about applying to the Land Restoration Fund for a commercial project where we'll be purchasing carbon credits and co-benefits from you, you need to consider the information in the Land Restoration Fund's Priority Investment Plan and especially the eligibility criteria for co-benefit classes that are set out in our co-benefit standard. Which co-benefits you can offer to sell to us depends on the assets you have on your property and the situation in your region. So for example, if you want to verify a co-benefit for threatened ecosystems, you need to have threatened ecosystems on your property and they need to improve in condition through your carbon farming activities. Co-benefits are a, a new concept, especially as they've been uh, framed by the Land Restoration Fund. So it's not a simple thing to decide on what they're worth. As the market develops and we see more rounds run by the LRF, that will become clearer. But for now, we're recommending that people think about the cost of delivering a carbon project with co-benefits as the price they need to ask to be paid for those co-benefits to make sure that they're not risking their financial well-being by entering into these projects. There are two pathways under the co-benefit standard for verification of co-benefits. There's a lower cost pathway which we call reports explaining what you've done in your project and how it's delivered the co-benefit. The alternative is what we call third-party assurance, which uses independent assurance pathways to demonstrate that the co-benefit has been delivered. There are some types of co-benefit that require third-party assurance, and that's particularly the case where there's not a clear connection between the co-benefit being verified and the activities that are required under the carbon project. The first co-benefit standard for the Land Restoration Fund uses the Accounting for Nature framework as the environmental approach for third-party assurance and uses the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation's core benefit standard as the third-party approach for social and economic and First Nations co-benefits. So projects engage with those independent parties, develop accounts or develop core uh, benefit statements to demonstrate to us that those co-benefits are being delivered and that's how they're verified and we'll then pay on delivery for those co-benefits. For more information visit the Land Restoration Fund website. Okay, so uh, that was a pretty good summary from John and particularly worth paying attention to the co-benefit standard that he mentioned. That's the core document that allows us to verify outcomes from co-benefits. So co-benefits aren't just a nice story. They're things that you have to actually be able to measure your outcomes against. 
and you'll be paid on the measurement of those outcomes and the verification mm -hmm. of those outcomes. Um, so I thought it was worth running, running through very uh, briefly. I won't spend too much time on this because there's lots of information on our website about the, the 2020 investment round. So we had $100 million um, out on offer last year um, and we attracted really good, um, high quality projects through that. We've, been, we've contracted 18 of those to date, um, a potential investment of around about $91 million. That's resulting in around about $1.8 million hectares of land uh, under contracted projects. And the average price we paid was $49 uh, per ACU. That's, um, so the, the average price now, uh, most people will understand that the spot price of, of um, carbon at the moment is around about $18, $18.50. So $49 is really quite an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary amount on average. But you've got to understand that 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 the ACU the ACU value is uh, made up of um, not just the carbon component but also the co-benefit component, um, and that just demonstrates the high quality value of project that we that we receive, where um, the majority of the value can be derived from the co-benefit outcome. So we had 16 projects that were helping protect the threatened, uh, protect, to protect threatened ecosystems. We had 18 projects providing more habitat for threatened wildlife, eight were restoring wetlands, 13 improving the health of reef catchments, um, six with economic opportunities for First Nations, and all, all projects were delivering uh, regional employment activities. Um, that uh, these are the projects that we that we funded. You can look at those on our website. I don't intend to go through all of those, um, uh, but you can certainly read more information about them. And we're developing more case studies on those as we go through. Um, so, what uh, what made a successful project? Um, so, this is a process that we ran through in in round one, and we intend for any future rounds that we run, we would intend to run the same type of process. Uh, so, we checked your eligibility against LRF investment criteria. So, um, a you had to be a Queensland based project. B you had to have a project that could be registered with Clean Energy Regulator, um, and there were a couple of other criteria as well. We, we then looked at, um, we looked at the projects on the basis of what data we have in Queensland and that was checked by scientific experts to say that, and then what they were looking for is just checking to see whether the environmental claims made by the projects are actually stacking up against the data that we already know. Um, and we looked at their due diligence and financial viability. I mean, these are commercial contracts that we enter into and we wanna make sure that, um, that, that it all stacks up. We looked at the value for money. So this is how we determine whether the pricing was right. So the price that was offered by the proponents was right for us. Um, so the ACU and co-benefits pricing was assessed against benchmark and investment metrics. So we, we looked at what else was being done in the environmental space in terms of who was spending money on what and determine whether um, the, the price we were being offered actually um, stacked up against those. Uh, we looked at the project design and risk mitigation was assessed. So we wanted to make sure that these projects actually stacked up and were able to be delivered. Uh, and then we handed them over to our investment panels. We have an independent investment panel that are made up of um, experts, external to government experts, and they make the final decision about whether we invest in projects or not. And their remit is to create a portfolio um, of projects that are, um, that are diverse, um, and that are robust and uh, basically good investments for the Queen, for Queensland. Um, so what made successful applications? Well, for those ones that were invested, they could make a very clear link between the activities to be undertaken and the co-benefits being delivered. Um, they had good evidence to suggest that those projects were going to actually deliver on those outcomes. Um, they had realistic costing and there were suitable project activities. So the project activities were actually related to the carbon, but also to the co-benefit outcomes. Um, and that they were highly beneficial in, the, in one or more of the priority investment plan. So the priority investment plan is another key document that indicates where we're interested in investing in. Um, so one of the priorities, for example, was we were looking for projects that would benefit the Great Barrier Reef, water quality, uh, and in particular, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, 
So the last few things I'll talk about are simply um, some of the issues that we're working on at the moment. So when we flip back out of our investment uh, mindset and uh, commercial mindset and into our market building uh, concepts, um, one of the things we're looking at is um, small scale projects. So we understand that um, one of the criticisms of the, of the carbon market is that um, the economies of scale don't re don't really encourage small scale projects to be invested in. Uh, we we did actually fund quite a number of small scale projects through our investment round one, but we need to be mindful that they are much more expensive um, projects. Uh, they um, they are uh, that it's much diff more difficult to, to demonstrate value for money with a small project than it is for a larger one. Um, and some of the challenge, some of the reasons for that is simply because uh, of the high cost of monitoring and reporting and complex uh, arrangements for sharing funding and risk. Um, so, as I talked about, you know, we have we have somewhat gone towards uh, solving that problem through paying more for some projects for, for carbon credit units, but we don't believe that that's the um, the the only solution. Uh, aggregation is one way of doing that. Um, you know, we'd like to see reduced transaction costs through um, just through different methodologies of um, of uh, verifying outcomes. Um, and uh, I guess use use of, of experienced professionals who are able to identify um, efficiencies within the projects is also recommended. Uh, and what have we got coming up? So we are working with CSIRO at the moment. So many people would have heard of the look-see tool that the CSIRO has developed. That's a tool that's um, been developed for estimating carbon um, outcomes on in project areas. So you can use their tool, you can map the area that you're thinking about putting a carbon project under and it'll calculate for you. It'll, it'll give you some information about what um, uh, what the carbon outcomes might be. So we've been working with them to develop a tool to, to extend that tool into the LRF to uh, give a high level overview of the co-benefits that might be achieved by that project as well. It's a starting point. The look tool is not a replacement for good, robust um, uh, business planning or business case, uh, but it's a starting point to pick interest in the market. Um, we are developing a, mar a market report with more information about the um, investment round. So that will be released hopefully on our website fairly soon. Uh, we will, we do intend to run the approved advisor course again, and we're just doing some refreshments to that at the moment and should be open again soon. And as I mentioned before, we will have more case studies up on our website as well. Um, that's about all I've got to talk about at the moment, Louise. I'm happy to hand over to questions now. Thank you, Gillian, and we'd love to see your face now. There you there are. There it is. Yeah. See the, the background. So thank you no for problem. running us through that. And thanks for Tom sort of facilitating a few questions as we've gone. But we have got a little bit of time where you might go back and revisit some of those questions, I reckon, Louise, so everybody gets to hear them. So I might pass to you to facilitate the little process before I wrap up at the end. Thanks, Chris. Um, I do have one more for Gillian that wasn't um, answered then. We had a few people typing away and Tom was Tom was earning his money oh, just then while nice. he was Look, talking. Louise, yes. Louise, I'd so love to take all the credit, but I can see there's about four Tom Websters logged in. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so, there's more than one. Yeah, I, I, was, I was weighing up whether to uh, admit to that, but I was, I was giving some really detailed answers there. <laughs> I thought, I'm doing well. Right. <laughs> That's great. That's Brett. Thank you then, Brett. That's great. Um, so I'll just ask you one question before we have another look at what those couple of those chat ones were. Um, this question came out when we had a meeting with the um, Carbon Community of Practice um, a week or so ago. Um, people were wondering about um, can you actually monitor co-benefits without using the frameworks of the Accounting for Nature or the Aboriginal Carbon Foundation? Like, is, are there other actions that landholders can undertake so that they can do their own? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's certainly not mandatory to use the, um, those frameworks. Um, 
uh, it's really third party assurance. It's called third party, third party, sorry, non third party assurance. So third party assurance is using the the accounting for nature framework or the uh, the um, core benefits verification framework uh, proponents. So um, if if you read the co-benefit standard, it'll tell you what the pathway ways are to verification. Um, I'm probably not the best person to talk to about that. I'm not sure if any of my team want to weigh in at the moment and help out with that question. Brett, if you're online. Yep. And Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, I think uh, Don's little bit of video, the second one, they talked about it a bit, but um, it depends on the link between the, the carbon method and the co-benefit outcome and where those links are very strong. So if you're claiming a native vegetation co-benefit and you're doing an environmental paintings project, for instance, if the project has been, the carbon project has been delivered, we um, can have some pretty, it's some simple monitoring that will tell us that the native vegetation um, co-benefit is being delivered as well. So the standard allows proponent level assurance, which might be as simple as photo point monitoring, um, activities, reports, and those sort of things you might be more, more used to in a grants program. Um, where the co-benefits and the methods are less clearly linked, so you might look at a threatened species outcome for a savannah burning project, um, then we will require third party assurance, so an environmental account to be set up um, to give some veracity to those claims. So. At the moment, accounting for nature is um, under our standard is um, a third party assurance um, program that we endorse, um, same with ABCF for the First Nations um, co-benefit outcomes. Um, that doesn't mean that sometime in the future someone else may develop um, similar standards and systems that we may add into our standard, but that's, um, that's what we've got at the moment. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, Brett. Um, I'm wondering if uh, anyone in the LRF team um, would like to talk a little bit about the look-see tool. So who might it be useful for? Um, is it something that the people online now who are talking to landholders could get familiar with first and start using it? Yes, Louise, that was a little difficult to understand. It was breaking up just a fraction, but I think what you asked about was the look-see tool and whether it was accessible, uh, easily accessed and um, easy to use. Is that Was that the gist of the question? Yeah, and is it something that the people online today could um, work with, like could learn how to use it and then go to their landholders with? It's very, it's a very intuitive system. It's very easy to use and absolutely um, uh, it's accessible right now. If you typed in, type in look, see into Google, the tool will come up and uh, it effectively just walks you through exactly what you need to do. Um, it's an excellent tool for starting off um, considering carbon and co uh, carbon for the moment. And then uh, down the line, it will also help with co-benefits from a land restoration perspective fun perspective and, as well. And can people who are looking at savannah burning projects um, work with it as well or is it mainly for the other veg and beef ones? No, I believe, and maybe I just need to talk to Brett again, but I believe that it does um, cover all methods. Yep. All right. We can have a look at that. Yeah, it's certainly worth having. I think, it, you know, for a start, it would be worth playing with what it brings up for you. Um, it may be even possible for us to arrange for a demonstration through CSIRO of the product. Thanks. I do have one more question um, that, that came up in a meeting a week or so ago, and I wonder, it might need someone to quickly find something and type, but I'm wondering what sort of amounts are people talking about for their monitoring costs, for monitoring the co-benefits? So obviously you don't want to tell us just what one person put in as their monitoring cost, but I'm wondering, is there a, a bit of an average or a bit of a, a ballpoint ball figure for how much to include? Is it a percentage for monitoring costs? Mm, Brett, are you able, have you got any information at hand? I, I doubt that we have that information in that detail, Louise. Yeah, I, um, I, I don't have that. It's not, an analysis we've done of the projects that came forward to us. 
Um, but it's not um, really, I think um, it's, um, and haven't run quite a few grants programs. Um, I know just the way people think about bringing these projects to us is, I think, in a, that kind of grants framework um, where you think oh, the, you might be able to have up to 10% admin costs for your proposal yeah. and those sorts of things. So we don't really have those. Uh, we don't look at it in that way. Um, so we are interested in in project costs in terms of the sort of um, financial viability of the project um, and, and to get an understanding of costs for our own benefit, but we don't place restrictions on those sorts of things. And this might go a little bit to one of the questions in the chat from Andrew about um, would we pay for some of those costs, so compliance and transaction costs? Well, we, we do. Um, so they should be built into... Um, Firstly, built into your project costs, and that's where the co-benefit payments come in. So um, the price that people are asking for ACUs for their projects was around about the spot price in general for, for carbon credits. And then the additional cost to deliver the project, um, including monitoring, audit team reporting, the rest of it are really built, built into the overall project costs. But in addition to that, um, on that sort of support for landholder side of things, we um, have an approved advisors program where we're offering up to $10,000 in rebates for people to get um, advice from um, financial advisors, agronomists, um, lawyers, carbon service providers, et cetera, um, up front. Um, they didn't have to bring a project to us to get that rebate, but that was something we, we did to sort of help out with some of those transaction costs uh, um, and getting people um, informed enough to know whether they had a project or not as well. So does that answer the question other than the fact that I didn't give you a figure? <laughs> <laughs> you told us you couldn't give us a figure. We get that. No, but it was. It's good that if that's um, in the end, if that's the way that it will end up happening. Sorry, I'll take my video off. If if in the end, after you've done a few projects, you get that picture, that might be a, a good thing to help people out as well. I think people are just asking how much, how much at the start. Yeah, I think I think one aspect of it. For Accounting for Nature, for instance, I'd just encourage people to go and talk to Accounting for Nature and find out what their costs are for the third party verification. And similarly with um, ABCF um, and that, uh, and then carbon service providers, their general model is to um, take a portion of the ACUs from a project in return for doing the reporting and auditing for the project. So um, you could also talk to you know a bunch of carbon service providers, and we of course don't endorse any of them particularly, but um, they, there's a general, I guess, industry model there where they take um, perhaps 25, 30 percent or something like that to deliver all of those um, elements of the project, which can be quite costly, um, but will vary from project to project. Thanks, Brett. Chris, can I ask another question? We still good? I think we're right for another five, oh, maybe another three minutes. Thanks, yep. Louise. I noticed Peter has written a, a question in the Q&A and it might just be a question for thought from now on. Um, and he's written, has anyone looked into the new um, uh, Duar Carbon and Biodiversity Program? That's probably a bit new for this. Um, so just in the Burnett Mary group at the moment. And yeah, so I wonder, you may not be able to comment about overlaps with um, LRF co-benefits or you may have. <laughs> I can, oh. um, I, I've said, we've certainly looked at it. Um, uh, we didn't have any advanced information on it. So I've, I've got as much information as anybody has on it. Um, the, in terms, it, it's very similar to the LRF in the edit that you have to register a carbon project as well. Um, but it's only looking at one method. So you can only do an environmental planting method, which gives them some benefits because um, it means that they, they're they focusing very much on their biodiversity co-benefit outcome. And they obviously see that the best benefits come from environmental planting projects. Um, so one method only, defined localities only for the pilot project. Um, the... It looks to me like what 
they they um, understand the types of biodiversity outcomes that they expect to see in the regions because they've got defined regions they'll expect to see particular biodiversity outcomes and therefore they'll judge projects on that basis of whether they're achieving the biodiversity outcomes that they expect. It is very similar to a co-benefit payment except that um, it looks like their payments are happening in the first uh, three years of the project uh, but then you've still got the ongoing 25 year project carbon project to still monitor and evaluate under so similar challenges um, diff slightly different um, way that they're approaching it and yeah single method measurement in in defined localities so that's what I, that's what I know about it at the moment um, uh, I think it's you know it's a it's a demonstration that the Commonwealth is dipping their toes into that um, biodiversity stewardship type of model. Um, it, I guess the outcomes of the pilot will determine how they take it forward as a more robust and long-term project. Um, it doesn't seem to me that they're looking at creating any additional environmental markets. It doesn't seem like they're trying to create a biodiversity credit or anything that can be on-sold or co-invested in, but that may be you know, something that they're looking at further down the track. Mm. Very good. Thank you. Very, well, very interesting. Yeah, it is. And it is a market, so that's all good. Um, yeah. I probably don't want to steal any more time there, Chris. Is it up to you or I'm just scrolling for questions? No, I think I think we will get close to wrapping it up. I reckon the last conversation is a really interesting one, Gillian. Like it, for somebody as old and ancient as me, who's been in this game for a long time and has talked to many people about having ecosystem services paid for landholders' stewardship of the land, we're starting to see it emerge everywhere now. And I think whilst the Land Restoration Fund, I imagine in the future will be one of many options, it's actually led the way on this. So whilst everybody else posted around, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this. You guys got ahead and got it done. Um, mm -hmm. And we're learning on the way. And so you deserve a lot of credit for that, I think. Um, and I think it's exciting for landholders and exciting for NRM practitioners that we're starting to see these options now emerge. Because in the end, we ultimately want the same thing. We want a really rich, vibrant regional community with strong economy, but most importantly, we want a really strong, futuristic, resilient landscape. And I think we're generating that out of your work. So thank you to you and your team for today, but thank mm. you for leading the way in a lot of the stuff that we're going to see emerge over the next few years. Um, yeah. So we will capture any other comments that came out today. Um, and so Louise will, will chase up any other responses to that. So thank you to everybody that did participate uh, along the way. And again, we'll be producing this webinar online so people can follow up and share it with others. I do want to highlight that between Adam and ourselves and myself, we've got a fair bit of material now on our website. So we got some fact sheets. We've got the ha the farmer's handbook that Louise has updated, sitting on both websites for you to use and share with landholders. Um, and Louise is actually working on a data a sort of data spreadsheet at the moment, which I guess was the generation of her question a little bit about costs and and how farmers manage the data requirements around what they need to do. Well, maybe it is, Louise. I don't know if you shake your head or not, but or which way you shake it. But anyway, we'll be working on some materials as well to help with some of that decision making around what farmers need to do to collect information to be part of this uh, program. So just to flag the next two webinars. So on the 25th of March, we've got the next webinar, which is learning from a carbon farmer. So that's actually using through Tom some um, contacts of people that have experienced the LRF process and will share with us how that process went and the good and the bad and the ugly I guess um, but it's really good to have a practitioner talking from their perspective so that's the next webinar and then the last one we've now secured John Connor from the Carbon Market Institute and for those that have listened to John talk a little bit he's a pretty inspiring guy in terms of talking about what's happening nationally but importantly what's happening internationally as well in the carbon market space and is a really active player so I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to John as well on the 22nd of April. So we'll keep circulating knowledge of that and information around that. And we really encourage you to circulate this webinar. It's not just for QFF and NRM regions members, it's for a lot broader than that too. So if you uh, want other people to join in, please, please encourage them to do so. So again, thank you, Gillian and your team today. And thank you for your ongoing investment support of us. And hopefully we're providing some support to you guys in a 
mutual way. So I think we just wind up, Louise, don't we? Do we have to do anything? Ella, I might just hand over to you. Do we need to do anything else? We just hit leave and thank everybody and have a good afternoon. All good. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you all, yeah. the Toms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. All live on.